Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this first lesson, we will uh, continue studying um, the propagation of wave packets. And we will start with a simple uh, example which we will solve. You add this, another example in your homework and the exercises. But uh, we will go over it and see what is the physical consequences of spreading of a quantum wave function. So the problem I have here is a very simple problem. I have, a, so to say, in a classical setting, it would be a plane with no friction, of course. There's no external walls. And there is a particle on it, and it has a mass m. And in classical world, if this particle has velocity zero in a reference frame where this guy is at rest, then, of course, this particle re will remain here because we are treating a case where there is no forces acting on this particle, so the potential field is uh, constant or non-existing at all. So it just stays here, very boring from classical point of view. What we treat now is a different case. It's a particle in quantum mechanics, so this is position x, which has an, at time t equals zero, <coughs> it has a, a Gaussian wave packet in such a way that its average momentum which means its average velocity uh, is going to be zero. So in that sense, it, it is similar to a problem where the velocity of the classical particle, CL is classical, is zero. So we know because there are no forces acting on this, uh, on this particle in the Schrodinger equation, that if initially the momentum, the average momentum is zero, it will remain zero forever. This we know because of Ehrenfeld's laws, because the, the force is zero, so the average of the force is zero, so the change of the momentum is zero, and then if it's initially zero, the average, then it will remain like this forever. And from symmetry, we understand immediately one thing. If this guy was a symmetric Gaussian, and its momentum is zero, so, okay, this packet is not going to move here, because there's no reason for it to go in one direction and not the other. And what we are kind of start to understand is that this guy is going to become wider and wider. So at l longer times, you will have something like this. So this is at some t, finite t, greater than zero. So you start thin and you end fat. You expand, your, your wave packet expands. And this means that the probability of finding the particle at the beginning was somewhere in this region. You had a finite probability of finding the particle. And at the latest time, you, will, you, you are able to find it also here and there with higher probability. So initially, your wave function is kind of in one region, but then it spreads out, and then you have higher and higher probability to find it further away from this origin, OK? So this is the physical context of this uh, type of problem. And we would like to solve it. So for that, we need a, a, an ingredient. And that is, I need to specify. So the, the, the problem I'm solving is for a free particle. And given an initial condition. So in quantum mechanics, the initial condition is a function. It's not a position like in classical mechanics. It's a whole function. And that is the wave function at all space x going from minus infinity to plus infinity. <coughs> we are going to assume it is of this form. So here, um, you, as you see, I start with a Gaussian wave packet. Then this drawing is appropriate. And it is controlled by a parameter A. A is a real number, um, which tells you what is the width of this guy. If A is very small, take A to 0, then for any x which is bigger than A, then of course this uh, exponential is going to be very small. So the smaller A. This initial step is, is becoming thinner and thinner and higher and higher. In, in addition, I have here n. What is n? n is the normalization constant. 
N is not arbitrary. We will soon determine it because we have this probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics. So psi x absolute value square is a probability density. So N is, it is not independent of A. Give, give me A, I'll give you N because the whole wave function is normalized. You can ask rightly how, in principle, can I prepare such an initial condition in the laboratory? That's a legitimate question. So the way people do it today is the following way. You build a potential. So remember, here there's no field, but I start with some potential field, V of x. And then I cool the system down. And it can be shown that in a potential, and we will show it in the next few lessons, that in a potential field, the initial wave function at zero temperature, that is the lowest energy possible uh, wave packet of the particle in a potential like this, is going to be a Gaussian shape. This depends on the parabola that I draw here. And the, the idea here is, again, we, to, to prove this, the, the proof will come later. I'm not proving anything right now. But why does this make sense? Why is such a wave function a minimum of the energy? Well, what is the minimum of the energy of a classical particle in this harmonic potential? What is it? What is the minimum energy? The particle is down here, right? The minimum of the potential energy, you put the particle in the minimum of the potential energy, and, and its kinetic energy is zero. That's the minimum of the energy of the particle. In quantum mechanics, what will happen if the wave packet is exactly on the minimum, so a very narrow thing? very narrow here. What will happen to the momentum? What? The greatest. The greatest. It will be dramatically huge because if you have a very narrow packet the, from the foreign Saturday principle, your, your delta x for example is very small so your delta p is very big on average from symmetry p average is zero and that would mean that if you are very localized like a classical particle your energy is high. So this Gaussian shape is kind of a um, balance uh, between a kinetic energy and potential energy in such a way that this Gaussian shape gives you the lowest possible energy. And that will correspond in experiment to very, very cold temperature that you need to cool the system very, to the lowest temperature, then it will lose its energy and then it will be of this type of shape. So this is a preparation method, and what you do in the experiment to see how this particle will propagate, what do you do to correspond to our problem? You start like this, and what do you do then? You turn off the potential. So if you have some, poten some fields, they create a well, you relax the system, they reach this Gaussian shape, you are in a potential, then you switch off the potential very quickly. If you do it very quickly, then you start the way the, the, the wave packet doesn't change due to the very fast quench. You simply delete the wave function, and then you are starting with a wave packet like this. And we start at this moment that this is what we call t equals zero. And then you let them propagate. So imagine you have a well here. You have sometimes you have many particles in the well. You quench the potential and then these particles will spread out. Then you'll measure where, how fast they come to some distance and things like that. This is done in Bose-Einstein condensation, many experiments today. But that's just a side remark, how you would prepare it in a laboratory, but there are many other ways, but we don't care too much about experiments right now. So we are just going to start with this Gaussian wave packet. And the question is, Okay, what is the question is obvious. What is psi x and t for the future times? How will, how will this wave packet evolve? So, the first thing to do is, uh, 
answer the question, what is n, the normalization constant? And the way we do it is that we know that the wave function at time t equals 0, absolute value squared dx, integral from minus infinity, has to be equal 1. And this, I remind you, is simply the fact that the particle must be somewhere in space. So if this is a probability density function, then you can find it in different locations. But if you sum up all over the space, all over different locations, the total probability of finding the particle somewhere is 1. Otherwise, there's no meaning that there is a half particle in your experiment. There is a particle inside. And from here, I can just take what is given in the exercise, and then I will take n absolute value squared, which is this n, and then I need to do this integral from minus infinity to infinity, exponent x squared over 2a squared dx. Why 2? Because I had here 4. And now I take the absolute value and square it, and I assume the a is real, and then I get this very simple integral. Now this is a well-known integral, and you should know these type of integrals uh, by heart by now, more or less. You saw them. You saw these type. Th these are Gaussian integrals. It's a family of integrals that you should know. You should know the Fourier transform of a, of a Gaussian. You should know. Um, how to do these integrals in principle, how do you do them? The way I remember is you square this and you multiply it by e to the minus y square over 2a squared dy. So you have this squared and then you have e to the minus x squared plus y squared. And then you change variables to spherical coordinates because x squared plus y squared will be r squared. Then you have the Jacobian, you have dx dy that turns into r dr. And then it's easy to do the integral because you get an integral of the sort r e to the minus r squared, which is the derivative of e to the minus r squared, and then you do the integral. So, okay, this uh, is just a reminder how you do these type of integrals. It's just that my point here is you need to know this, so you, you have to have a notebook with all these integrals. I'm not going to do it here. And the simple answer is simply that this guy is equal to n squared. There is a pi, of course. Uh, square root of 2 pi a. So all this must be equal 1. That means that uh, n is uh, 1 over 2, po 2 pi 1 fourth because here I had square root. Now I am taking the another square root uh, 1 over square root of a. And of course, these are the units of this wave, pack, wave function. You see, it's 1 over length square. So the units here are 1 over meter to the power half, because psi squared is 1 over meter, right? So everything works here. and. You see, as I said before, n depends on a. If you change a, you change the normalization, but that's an initial condition. We have some a in such a way that it is normalized. OK. Um, notice that in this normalization, I, I say n is equal to this, but if you were a mathematician or you were just annoying me, then you would say, uh, but here you have n absolute value squared. So you cannot really determine the normalization exactly. Because I can also multiply this, if I want, by some ei phi. And phi is a some, uh, it's a real number. Because ei phi absolute value will give you 1. So the whole wave function, in some sense, you, you can determine up to the phase. But we actually don't care about this at all. Because we don't measure psi, we, we can have information on psi absolute value squared. So you can always multiply it by some ar arbitrary phase, but most of the time we would simply choose this phi to be zero. And it's obvious for physicists that it is OK. But mathematically, in principle, there is a phase, but it doesn't contribute. Because this phase, of course, is independent of position and time. It's just a number. Yes, this is what I mean here. 
Okay, so now how do I solve uh, the problem? Well, first of all, just as a reminder, what we are solving here. We are solving this problem, which is the Schrodinger equation, p squared 2m psi. Why am I solving this equation? Because I mentioned before, we have no potential. This is the Hamiltonian, the operator, and the Hamiltonian in this case as p squared, and p is the operator minus i h d over dx. So this is actually the second derivative in x of this wave function, and this is what we are solving. Now we solve this in full generality in previous uh, lesson. We know a lot about the dispersion relation of this equation. All this was done, I'll remind you a few points, but the general solution was given uh, in the following way, by which we can easily understand, or I hope you understand already. So the wave function generally will be given by 2 pi half integral from minus infinity to infinity gk exponent i k x minus omega k t and the idea behind this equation was the following this solution this part of the solution is the free so called free wave free wave is exactly this exponential it's like the cosine plus the sine so it's a wave that stretches from minus infinity to infinity. And this is the basic solutions. That is the modes of, if you want, of the system. <coughs> and what we are doing here, we are saying for each k, which is the wave vector that re relates to the momentum, actually, for each k, there is some weight function, gk. So when gk is very big on some k, it means the component of this part of the weight is strong. And when gk is very small, it means that part of the k is not so important. So this is essentially a summation. In, look at this integral as a sum over all the possible values of k that you can get in this system, which stretch from minus infinity to the infinity with a weight function gk. And gk is the amplitude of getting uh, the, the wave vector k. Or in other words, this is the amplitude, the probability amplitude of getting some momentum whose value is h bar k. Okay, we here have also omega of k, and omega of k is very important, is, is given by the dispersion relation which is found from this Schrodinger equation, and because the Schrodinger equation has here second derivative, so when I plug in this solution, this free wave solution, you remember, I, I plug it in, then I take the second derivative in space, then I get k squared. So this guy is equal to h k squared over 2m. And you remember when I multiply this by h bar, then this will be h squared. This will be like energy. So this is like Einstein h bar omega equal energy. But now we are doing it for a particle. <coughs> and this is the dispersion relation and all I need now is to uh, remind myself what is GK so I hope you remember what is GK GK is given by well what I didn't use here the initial condition so I need to write down the formula that we derived the initial condition is given by GK is luckily given by the Fourier transform so this is in k space, momentum space, so I have to transform from position x to k uh, e i k x times uh, let's write n here uh, it was minus, okay one was with minus, yeah if he's plus then he's minus Right, thank you. One of them should be plus, the other one should be minus. Uh, 
and then I have here minus x squared over 4a squared dx and this guy here this in the exponent this is simply with this n this is simply the initial condition so the general formula is take the Fourier transform of the initial condition this is the initial condition in my problem then I get back gk so the idea is initial condition Fourier transform it get gk take gk plug it into this equation do this integral then you get the wave function at time t so in our case so, so the first thing is to find g of k but let us look for a second on this integral well it's easy right I mean otherwise I would not be solving it here What did we forget? Can't hear you. What did we forget? Nothing. Good. Um, so, the first thing is to find g of k. The first thing is to look at this integral. What do I have here? I have an integral over x. But what type of integral is it? It's a Gaussian integral. It's a Fourier transform of a Gaussian. A Fourier transform of a Gaussian, you add it in your exercise, or you add it many times in your past. What is the Fourier transform of a Gaussian? Gaussian. It's a Gaussian. It's the conservation of the Gaussian when you go from x space to k space. If you remember that, or if you don't remember, do the integral, be my guest. You can immediately write g of k well maybe you don't remember the numbers but you you know the units so it's a Gaussian right so it's some exponent because again it's Gaussian because in x it's Gaussian so also in k is Gaussian so I have your k squared now what what will appear here well what would be what what will we find here K has units of 1 over position, so the only thing that has position here is A. So here I'll have A squared. And I agree you have to do the calculation to remember this number here, etc. But guess what? What is the number here? It's 1, and the, the, the reason is, that's the reason why I chose this, this 4 here. Okay, so that's just for convenience. And then I have here N square root 2a which okay you have to think a little bit that this integral is trivial you change variables and then you will easily see x squared over a then it's easy to change variables and get this from textbook and that this just means as we, we discussed the gk absolute value squared which is the amplitude of finding a vector k is also a Gaussian. If you integrate over all k, you'll get over, over this, you'll get a unity. And it just means that the highest probable uh, momentum component is zero, but you have some components of order. What is the width here? Order of one over a. Yeah, this, this width, if you take, for example, the maximum half width, this size is roughly 1 over A. So here you saw the, in some sense, the uncertainty relation. If, let's say, A is very small in X position, so in X position, this is a time zero. I add this also Gaussian thing. But this width was of order a as a function of x. So if a is approaching zero, this is very narrow, you are very thin. What happens to the wave packet in momentum space? It becomes very wide. So if you are thin in one space, you are fat in the other and vice versa.
Now all we need to do is uh, plug in one. Let's call this one. Plug in equation one. And we get uh, the solution as an integral. Um, Okay, I use this expression and I have this 2 pi over square root, so I have 2 pi half. This is this guy. From GK I have n um, square root 2a. So I'll do this. Then I have an integral. The, here I have uh, e to the minus k squared a squared. I want to write it like this, yes. So this comes, you see this comes from g of k from here. This comes from g of k. Then I need to write plus ikx. These are the waves in position. These are e i k x is the wave, each component of the wave. That is, this is the one over the wavelength. And now I'm going to use here minus i h bar k squared 2m. What is this guy? This is the frequency, and it has the special dispersion that goes like k squared. So I use this guy and this guy times t. And all this is an integral dk. So here you see the initial condition in, in Fourier space, the amplitude of the, of the waves. Here you see the waves in space, eikx. And here you see the dispersion in time. It's a superposition of many waves, this part, which give you the full wave packet. Now, the question that we have here is, is this an easy integral or is this a complicated integral? Well, it's not so complicated, but maybe, you know, if you do it the first time, you might have some mistake in doing the integral. But it's not so complicated. Why is it not so complicated? Because you see, you have k squared, k squared. So, OK, I can take all this junk together with this a and put it together and call it some number or aleph or whatever you want. And then I need to do a Fourier transform. So essentially, what do you have here from k to x? I have a Fourier transform of a Gaussian. But the, the prefactor here, before it was simply 1 over a squared. Now it's this guy plus this guy. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's easy. So we will not do this, but instead we'll simply, I'll give you the final result. So it's an integral, a Gaussian integral. And I will also tidy this integral a little bit. So it's a Gaussian integral. So we know that it's going to be a, what do we know about this x, x dependence of this wave packet? It's going to be Gaussian, right? The only thing is, what, what is its width exactly? And also, we will be interested in, not in the wave packet, but in the wave packet squared. So the wave packet squared at some time t, so I solve this integral and I square it, is given by this uh, expression, n absolute value, 1 plus h bar t squared, or m squared a4 power half 
exponential of minus x squared for a squared 1 plus h squared t squared for m squared a4. And this is the solution I want to discuss now. What does this describe? So essentially what it describes is what I said before, very qualitatively. I start with some wave packet, which is Gaussian. And then, as I said, it spreads out and out, etc., etc. And how do you see this? You see, at time t equals 0, this guy, uh, wait, what was the initial wave packet? Some small mistake. Yes, right, I made a mistake. This is a two. And how did I discover this now? It's actually written here. Well, take t equals zero. t equals zero, this vanishes, and the initial wave packet was a Gaussian with 2a squared. Go back in your notebooks. So here you have a 2, not a 4, like I wrote. And, but, but what does this thing say? You have a Gaussian, and you remain a Gaussian forever. You started with a Gaussian, you remain a Gaussian. This comes because of the dispersion relation, which is going like k squared. And you see at the beginning, you had the width of the Gaussian, which is given by this expression, by a. By a. But this a is now increasing, becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And as time goes, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And as it becomes bigger, it means that you become fatter and fatter and fatter. Now, from conservation of probability, if you widen, you also have to go down. Because the area underneath these curves is always unity. And this you see here. You see, if I look at the amplitude, let's say I, I, put, I look at x equals 0, then you see that the wave function goes like 1 over time. It declines with time. So this is this peak, tuck, tuck, tuck. It's going down. So you're going, you are becoming wider, and you're also shrinking in time and spreading out. So this is what is, what is happening here, but let us understand it more qualitatively. So first of all, you see that the width is controlled by this number. This is dimensionless because I put it here, there's one. This guy has to be dimensionless. It cannot have units. <coughs> and let us check what are the units of h squared, t squared, m2, a4. Well, h is, for example, energy squared t to the 4. This h bar is energy times time. Here I have m squared Let's call it x to the 4. x is like a. a is meter or whatever. In the usual way, people use notation. So what is e? This is m squared, x to the 4, t to the 4. This is the energy squared, t to the 4, x to the 4. All this from point of view of units is the same as the units of, of, a, of a number 1, for example. So, okay, at least I didn't make a mistake, and this guy is dimensionless as it should be. Now you can start understanding a little bit more about quantum mechanics, especially its correspondence to classical mechanics. What is the meaning of classical mechanics in our problem? What will happen classically? Well, 
you need some imagination because there's a wave packet, not a, not a point. What do I mean, what will happen classically? What I mean by that is, in a classical world, our intuition says, you start with some uncertainty, you start with some uncertainty where your particle is at time t equals zero. And there's no forces, there's no velocity, so this uncertainty will remain forever, right? Because you simply don't know where the particle is. And this is exactly what is essentially happening here. This happens when, when h bar t squared over m to the power 2, a to the power 4, is much, much less than 1. In that case, it doesn't matter, I can have you 4, this is not important. In that case, you can just throw this to the junkyard, right? And then, if a is small, then, you know, let's say you have a measurement, you cannot find your particle with some uncertainty because of some problem in the machine or whatever. Okay, it remains like that forever. So this is what I call the classical limit. I want to call it classical limit. And you start seeing why this makes sense. For example, if I take h bar, I told you before I can take h bar. Of course, in reality, h bar is a number. But mathematically, I can take h bar to zero to see how I go to the classical world, because in classical mechanics, in Newton's equation, there's no h bar. So somehow in the limit h bar to zero, we expect to get classical mechanics. And indeed, if I take h bar to zero, then OK, this guy is very small. In that sense, you'll get classical limit. But you can do something a little bit better. Of course, also when the mass is very big, like your mass of one kilogram, you see big masses, no classical mechanic, I mean, no quantum mechanics, because if m is very big in this sense, then of course, you are gone. But you can say, oh, but you have your t, and I can make t as much as big as I, I can want in principle. So you can say, oh, if I have a one kilogram sitting here on a table, uh, and I start with a wave packet like this, if I wait long enough, this guy will be big. Let us see what will happen, though. So let us uh, look at numbers. So what is h bar squared? 10 to the minus 36, 34 squared. Here I have t squared. Mass, let's say you have one kilogram. So this is one kilogram, a heavy particle. That's what I mean by heavy particle. A, A4, A to the power 4. Let's say that your uncertainty is of order of what we think as uncertainty. Uncertainty in your, in your height. What is it? One centimeter, half centimeter, something macroscopic. So one centimeter is the same as one meter, right? Because there's no difference. One meter. Why do I say this? Because soon you'll see. I can put here also 10 to the minus 6. It doesn't matter. So to, to see quantum, from here I can say that to see quantum effects, what, how long do I need to, to wait in this example? Roughly. What is the time? Hmm? This is square. No, with both of them are squared. Did I make a mistake here? Oh, no, 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 no. Wait. So you see here, if this is one, this is one, 10 to the minus three, this is two, then when 10 to the 34. Where does this 34 come from? It comes from h bar. How old is the universe in your opinion? opinion. Well, in Barilan it might be dangerous to ask, but it's uh, 10 billion years, and that's roughly 10 to the 17 seconds. 
So this is much longer than the age of the universe. So it means that in principle, but it's totally academic, if you have a particle of one mass and you wait for this amount of time, you will see some quantum effect. But of course, this is total nonsense because you cannot prepare a particle, uh, even for shorter times, I mean, not because you will die in the, in the meantime, also because there's no such thing as a free particle, right? There's always some interaction, and this is just a joke, right? But my, and, th and that's why I can put here meters, but if I, if I would put here also, uh, you know, 0 0.1 centimeters or whatever, it's totally irrelevant. But on, on the microscopical scale, what is the mass here? This is, let's say, the mass of an electron. This is very 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. A is the size of an atom. It's 10 to the minus 10 meters. And then this number is, on some reasonable time scale, it is appreciable. So when the mass is small, uh, the size of the initial system is small, you can get some reasonable times, if you can measure these times, that uh, you will see the quantum effects, you will see the spreading. Again, not in the macroscopical world, not in uh, the world where we measure things in, in kilograms and meters, but in the world that we have 10 to the minus 27 proton or 10 to the minus 31 electron kilograms and scales of Armstrong's, then it's going to be super important. And that is, of course, what we expect because quantum mechanics was discovered when we started looking more and more into atomic structure, not when we looked at macroscopical objects. Otherwise, Newton would have found it already. So it's not so easy to reach the quantum limit experimentally, and that's why it is a revolution of the 20th century and not something that anyone could imagine in the, the old days of Newton, Maxwell, etc. Okay. It is also easy from here, you see this uh, width here and this width here are the same. And that is also obvious. Why is that the same? I mean, you have here the square root. It's the same because of conservation of probability. So whatever the width here is, you expect to get it also, also here. Uh, and that's what you get. Remember, the n depends on a, so it's a bit confusing. but. The A is also hidden here, inside here. So just to summarize this, OK, so. Another thing is, can we kind of hand wavingly, without solving any equation, explain this expansion, this spreading? How do you do that? You can do this by hand waving. Hand waving means I'm totally not rigorous now, but um, where is the. Maybe we'll do the opposite way. What? The size squared, you put the mass. This? Yes, you have a root down there. Here? Yes, why? Psi has a root, but when you take the square. Um, well, um, no. W what do you mean? This is dimensionless, yes? Here? Yes. The same as here? Yes. Um, I don't think so. Why do you say that? Because. Psi um, squared. Psi squared. Wait one second. Uh, this is. Wait, let me see first of all. If you are right, then I'll spare you. Wait, then may you say like this, but no, I mean in the Psi you have a one over four, I claim. Um, so when I square it I get the one over half. 
No, you don't have half. I have one over four. When I do the psi. The, 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 this, remember I have your n. This at t equals zero is zero. So this is one, no matter what is the, at t equals zero, this is the same. So let us just look at the normalization if I get, uh, you, what you need to do is you need to do this uh, integral. Um, yeah, you need to do the integral from zero to infinity to check this. Let us check your claim. I have here something that I want to call, let's say A is equal one, and then I have here two C. C is all this junk, right? And then I have this one over C to the power half. This is what I wrote. Uh, C to the half. And then I have to integrate over dx to get the normalization. Okay? And then I define x over c to the half. I want to define it as y. Then when I change variables here, I'll get integral e to the minus y squared over 2 dy. That is of order 1, independent of this c. And that's why this is OK. Do you get my point? No, I understand what you said. I'm just saying it's still supposed to be. Well, here it's the proof. So you have to have here a half, because when I integrate all this guy, I have to get something which is independent of time. Because the normalization, if I integrate over x, the normalization is independent of time. And you see here, because you have x, c over half, and x squared with c. So if you add here c, yes, that's your suggestion, not mine. You'll have here c over half. This would be a number, and this will decay with time. And then you will have no normalization. So I don't understand the question. Why, why do you think this is wrong? It's right. Okay, but let us look now, why do we have this guy here? With hand-waving arguments, hand-waving. Explanation. So, I can use, I can do it in two ways. One is with some uncertainty principle. I can say the uncertainty principle says like something like this. P typical, which I'm not interpreting exactly what I, what I mean here. It is the typical kinetic energy, if you want, or the fluctuation of the momentum, or delta P in Heisenberg relation. And then I have some delta X squared. This is the uncertainty relation, if you want. This is delta P. And this is roughly equal to what can it be equal to h bar. What are you explaining? I'm explaining why do you have this type of spreading, what exactly this means, the spreading of the pack packet, which is the whole phenomena here. So I want to say that I have a delta p delta x equal h bar in this packet. This ha kind of hand-waving argument, then I have to ask myself, at time t equals 0, what is delta x? What can be delta x? So I can say that this p typical squared, what is delta x? It's time t equals 0. It's a, a squared. Now, this, uh, now I want to know what is delta x at some time t, quote unquote. Well, it's a squared. This is the uh, this is the uncertainty you had at the beginning at time t equals zero. And now you you think about this packet at time t equals zero. You have tip you have momentum p squared given by this relation. 
So I'm going to write here p typical squared. To make it position, I need to divide it by m squared. And then I have to multiply by t to the power 2. Because this is just velocity squared, t squared. So imagine you have some packet, you have some uncertainty in the packet, and then in this packet you have many particles, and they have so this typical velocity which gives you the spreading. This is, th this is the width of the packet after some time t. Now I use that uh, expression, and then I get a squared, 1, because p squared, oh. yeah, OK, I'll leave it like that. So, so here you see that p typical is h bar over a squared. So I take out a squared, because I did that also here. This is this like a squared. I multiply this by 1. This is the initial uncertainty. Then I have here a h bar squared. This is this h bar squared. And now I have a to the fourth, because I took a to the power 2 outside. And then I need to multiply by m squared t2. And this is exactly what I got. I mean, OK, there's a 4 here, but it's exactly the same. So what is happening here? You have a wave packet at time t equals 0. You have uncertainty in the position of the initial of, of the particle initially. That is this a squared. But you have also uncertainty in the momentum of the particles inside. So they are spreading. And they have a typical p squared. And then they are spreading p times t. p over m is velocity. Velocity times t, you get the spreading. Of course, I need to always look here at the squares. Why? Because the average, on average, you are not moving. So I look at the squares. And this is how I get this. Another way to, to get the same thing, what did I do here? I used the uncertainty principle that p squared times a squared delta p the, the delta x is roughly h bar here. Of course, you can always claim, oh, the number here is wrong, but this is not the goal of this type of hand waving. But another way to see this is say, OK, what is roughly the kinetic energy at the beginning? Well, you can actually calculate the average kinetic energy. How do you do that? You take p squared and you calculate, do the calculation. But what is the kinetic energy without doing any calculation? Well, it's p squared over 2m. And you need to average. The average is average with respect to the wave function. That's some integrals. I don't want to do any integral anymore. But what is this roughly? I need to calculate this. You will have here, from p, you have h squared. You have 2m. That is from this definition. And what will happen when I take the second derivative in space of the wave function, square it, and do the integral? That has to be of the order of 1 over a squared. Because that's the only length scale I have here. But this is what I called before p-typical squared over 2m. And here you see again that p-typical is exactly as we had before, h bar over a. Here there is a missing square. So it doesn't matter how you look at it, the point here is very simple. You have a length scale a in the problem. The length scale is the initial condition. This length scale has to determine the momentum somehow. Because momentum is like k, it's 1 over position. The only length scale is 1 over a. Here you go, p typical, h over a. And then you are spreading with this p typical, and you see the spreading, which is exactly according to this type of interpretation. OK, so just to summarize this, uh, first of all, let us look one 
small point that I didn't mention. Let us calculate for a second. This is just a trick that is kind of something that will help you in the future. What is the momentum at time t equals zero in this problem? In principle, you might waste your time in your exam and try to solve this integral. Which is fine. You do it, but if you do it in an exam, you will waste so much time that you will never finish the exam. In our case, what was the wave function? It was a Gaussian. But let us assume that you have psi x0 is a real function. In our case, a Gaussian. Then I know that this guy is 0. So if the wave function is real, there's no complex part of it. We know immediately that the average momentum is zero. Why do we know that? Because this wave packet is real. This is real. The derivative is also real. And I have this i here. The average momentum cannot be proportional to i. So for real function, this guy is always proportional to i. And that means that it, it cannot be, because the average momentum cannot be proportional to a complex number. And that means it has to be 0. Of course, you can calculate this for all kinds of uh, functions and do this integral, but there's no need. If this is a normalized, legitimate wave function, this guy will always give you 0 also here. So because of 2, we have p average of t is 0 for all t. And for that reason, the maximum of the wave packet stayed on 0. That is, we had no translation. This is also obvious just from symmetry, because if the wave function is symmetric, there's no reason why it will move to one way or the other. We saw from the solution that the thinner you are, at time t equals 0, thinner means that a is very small. you spread out faster. And this is because when you are thin, you have high momentum in the packet, and then you spread very quickly. Due to thin, it's time t equals 0, high components of momentum. This we showed with the uncertainty principle, with all these, and then faster expansion. <coughs> For macroscopical objects, and uncertainty is initially we get a classical description.
And we also, of course, demonstrated how to solve these problems by, get, by working in Fourier space. Fourier space, Fourier analysis, is useful for construct construction of wave packets. But there is a limitation here, of course. This is only not, on, not, not only for, initial, for any initial condition, but this is only for the case where you have no force. Once you have a force, you break the translation invariant symmetry on the X space, not every position is the same, and then Fourier analysis is not good. And then we will see in, already in the next lesson how do you go from Fourier analysis, which is only good for free particles, free or false, to more general solution when you have a force. And that was what is going to interest us uh, the most in the next uh, coming lessons. So, so <clears throat> our aim now is to start dealing with time independent Schrodinger equation. So, in quantum mechanics, actually, we have two types of Schrodinger equations. One is the Schrodinger equation that we discussed up to today, which gives you the time evolution of the wave function, how it spreads out. And then there is also uh, the so-called time independent, that does not depend on time, Schrodinger equation. This equation is very useful because it gives us a way to calculate energy levels. For example, you have an hydrogen atom, or you have any atom you can imagine, and you want to know the energy levels in this atom, you will use the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Now, these two equations are related to one another, but now, uh, and if you know the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, independent Schrodinger equation, you know the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and this is how we will uh, proceed. We will show the connections between the two, but my bottom line is that there, we are going now to be starting to really a go, starting to see the quantum. Because up to now, where was the quantum? Of course, we had H bar, but we didn't have energy levels which were quantized. Energy levels quantized means that you have discrete energy levels like you have in the hydrogen atom. This is why we call this field quantum mechanics, for example, the energy levels in atomic system are quantized. But up to today, the energy levels of a free particle were not quantized because the energy went like k squared, and k could be anything. So they were continuous, actually. So this comes about from the fact that we, want, we deal with, um, with, with, with the particles in a potential, in a confining potential. And actually, if you go look at the first paper of Schrodinger, he doesn't think about particles spreading in space. He knows. He built an equation and he knows that its applicability is for the atom, and in the atom you have forces. So he immediately started dealing with particles that forces are acting on them, and this is what we are going to do now. So goodbye free particle, now we have some interaction, some force acting on the particle. So the Schrodinger equation, the time dependent one, is given by this. So I'm going to work in one dimension and I have this Hamiltonian psi xt. And h, as before, is the momentum operator, the second, the, the derivative in space so over 2m plus v of x. I'm going to assume now that v of x does not depend on time. So this is not a function of time. This is going to be important and we will assume this. If we want to solve this equ equation, well, we remember one very general principle, the principle of superposition. That is, this equation is linear with psi, so if I can find one solution, and then a family of solutions, 
I can later add them up. We did this already, right? We did it for the free wave, EIKX minus omega KT, and then we added many, many of these waves and we built a wave packet. But that we could do only for the free particles. Now we want to do something similar, getting one solution of this guy, and then we're going to add many of them to compose the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So how do we do that? There is a method which is general. You might have heard about it and maybe not. And that is called separation. Well, it's not exactly of variables, but I'll call it separation of variables. And that is, let us guess a particular solution. We don't care now about the initial condition. Let us guess a solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which is a multiplication of two functions, a function of x and a function of time. Later on, we will take many of these solutions. There are many. They will depend on some n index, like the energy or like the k previously. And we will sum them up. But this is just a particular solution. So let us look what will happen. If I have h, which is the right-hand side of the Schrodinger equation, acting on this <coughs> very special solution, this is f of t, some function of t, which I don't know h phi of x what did they do here h you see here is containing p squared p squared is the second derivative of x x this, uh, there is nothing in this operator h that is acting on time directly so when i take h it doesn't change f of t because f of t is a function of t and not x so i can put it here i can take h and put it here because h does operate on this function because it is a function of h. On the other hand, I know that this guy is i h d over dt psi. How do I know that? That is the Schrodinger equation. Now you have here the time derivative. And this guy is phi of t, f of t times phi of x. So what will happen here? Exactly the opposite. Here I'll get i h phi of x d over dt f of t. Again, because this guy phi is independent of time now. Now, if I look at these two things, I can rearrange them. I can rearrange them, and I, from that equation, I'm going to write it the following way. I'm going to write it as um, h, it's an operator, phi of x. And I'm just dividing here all this equation, dividing by phi of x, f of t. And I'm doing it on this side, and I'm doing it also on, on this side. So when I divide this f t h phi of x by this thing, f of x phi of t, what will I get here? Simply phi of x, because f of t will cancel. And I, when I do the same on this side, I divide by phi of x, f of t, f of phi of x will cancel. So this guy is equal to i h bar f of t dot, that's the time derivative, over f of t. Now look what I got here. I got here something, it can be very nasty, but this is, what is this guy? This is a function. Of what? Of x only. What is this part? It's a function of t only. So 
I have uh, some function of x, complicated, some function of t, and they are equal. How can they be equal for all x and all t? The only way that they can be equal for all x and all t is that these guys are equal some constant, and this constant I'm going to call e. So e is some constant. I give it the energy name because you'll soon see it has a meaning of energy. <coughs> but it is for me, it is some constant at this stage in such a way that these Schrodinger solutions of Schrodinger equations will be holding for any x and for any t. And then this can be satisfied. Immediately I can gain something. I know something on f of t. Because the equation for f of t is rather simple. What is the solution of this equation? Up to some constant. I don't care about the pre-factor constant because that will come eventually in the normalization at the end of the day. So this guy, the solution is f of t. Here is a constant that I don't care at this moment. Exponential. I E T over H bar. You already had a taste for this. For example, for free waves, this was like omega T. The same thing, but now there's some energy. Of course, omega is related to energy. This also, you know, from intuitive physical arguments because of Einstein, h bar omega is equal e. So here, what you get is the natural thing that e over h. This has units for sure of energy, so e over h has a meaning of, a, of some kind of frequency. But it's much more general than the free particle, and soon we we'll, we we still don't know what is e. He can be at this stage anything, right? But we need to find it. <coughs> On the other hand, I have also an equation which actually gives me what is E, because I have your H phi of X over a phi of X, E. So what I do is I simply multiply this equation by this side, and then I get H phi of X, E phi of X. This is the time independent, time independent Schrodinger equation. This guy up here is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. This equation we are going to work on very much, actually, most of the course will be on this equation. One reason is practical, and that is this equation gives you the energy levels. And because quantum mechanics deals with energy levels of atoms, molecules, whatever you want, and because that is what is easiest to measure, most of the work in quantum mechanics is devoted for this equation. It doesn't mean that this is the fundamental equation. Actually, this guy is the fundamental equation, because it's time dependent. But if you just want to know the energy levels of some atom, you have to have Hamiltonian. Give me the Hamiltonian of this atom. Find out these energies. And then you have, you go to the lab and you compare. So this is a machine that spits out energy levels of all the elements that you want of many, many systems. And that's why it was investigated really very, very carefully and actually a lot of emphasis is given on this guy and a little bit less maybe on that guy. So what is the solution of the, of the time dependent Schrodinger equation? I go back to this equation. This, th this solution, I'm going to write it now, it depends on E. And we will see later what is E. Why can't I say too much now about E? Because I didn't tell you what is V of X. For every potential, there will be different energy levels. The energy levels can be discrete. They can be continuous, different problems. 
but generally speaking, this wave function depends on E, and E can take many variable, many different values, which we would like to know what are those possibilities. So, but what is the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation? Now, what do I need to do? So the solution of time-dependent Schrodinger equation, this, this guy, is given by psi. This is in one dimension, but it's easy to write this also in higher dimension. A sum over all the possible energies. What are these values of energies I get out from this equation? So this, this guy gives you some energy levels, and then I'll sum over all of them. That's the meaning of this sum. And I also say that you'll soon see that when I write here a sum, the sum can be also an integral. Sum and integral is the same thing. That will depend, is the energy level discrete or continuous? Then I have some coefficients, CE. Then I have phi E of x, E minus E t over h bar. Why do I claim that this is a solution? One of these guys here, this multiplication here, with one energy, one component is a solution. And the equation is linear. The Schrodinger equation up here is linear. And then I have the superposition. So I can add many, many solutions. And there will also be a solution due to the linearity of the Schrodinger equation. And if you don't believe me, take this solution with some constants, C, and just take it and plug it into the Schrodinger equation, and you will see that each component by itself is a solution, and then the sum of many is also a solution. So this is the general solution, but here I'm missing something because I don't know what is C, E. So what is C, E? How will I determine this number or set of numbers? There are many of them. What did I did not what did I did not use up till now? What? The initial condition. The initial condition. So C E will be determined by the initial conditions. So because it's such an important equation, let us write it again, the time-independent Schrodinger equation in one dimension. Instead of writing the Hamiltonian, I'm writing it explicitly. For example, later on, not today, we will solve the particle in harmonic potential. And towards the end of the course, we'll do it in three dimensions, and here we will have the Coulomb potential. And each, each problem will give you a set of energy levels, and that is the aim of the course, more or less, to find these energy levels. You saw all this for the free particle in some sense. We can identify phi e for the free particle quite easily. So for a free particle, let's say v of x is a zero, 
then the time, independ time independent Schrodinger equation is very simple. You have no potential. So this program that I told you says, OK, solve the Schrodinger equation with no time in it. And see what are these phi of x, which, as I mentioned, that they depend on e. They depend on some parameter e. Well, what is the solution? Phi of e, phi of x, is e i k x. Why? When I take the second derivative here, I'll get h bar k, k squared over 2m equal e. What does this mean, though? It means that the energy E is h bar k squared over 2m. What is f of t, then? f of t is, as we had before, so we already deleted it, minus i, the energy over h bar times t. So this is energy over h bar times t. I just plug this one in. It's h k squared 2m t. Of course, this is nothing new. This is the part of the wave function of the wave. This is also the time-dependent part of the free particle. Before, we just had them both together. Now we do it in two steps. In this case, it's no need to do this, but in the more general case where you have a potential, then these steps are useful, right? So then I get uh, what is the meaning of this uh, sum here, psi x of t, is a sum of the, the all energies. What is the meaning of all energy? sum of all energies? I sum of all the k's. Because E depends on a number, and the number can be anything. K can be from, a, from a minus infinity to infinity. So I sum, and this is in quote unquote, minus infinity to infinity. I'll soon explain what I mean by quote unquote. Then I have some G of K. G of K, what is G of K in our language, the new language? This is exactly like C of E. Just I write it so you will see that it is the same. Now I have phi of e, e i k x. This is phi of e. And then I have f of t, h k squared t over 2m. This is f of t for a free particle. And what is happening here? Here, the values of k are continuous from minus infinity to infinity. And the energy, if I plot it, is just a parabola as a function of k. See this, this formula. So this sum in the previous lesson, what was it? was an integral. So when I say sum, it's a sum if the energy levels are discrete. The sum is an integral when the energy levels are continuous. But you know that an integral is the same as a sum. So you will have to uh, distinguish between two different types of system. This is a system with a continuous spectrum that energy can take any positive value. So the energy here is always greater than zero. Why does the energy have to be greater than zero? Well, it's also like that in classical mechanics because it's free particle, energy is p squared over 2m, so p squared is a positive, only positive. In the quantum language, if E would be negative, K would be imaginary. If K would be imaginary, then the wave function would decay, either at plus infinity or minus infinity. That is not good and that's not allowed. Why? Because then the wave function will not be normalizable. You cannot have here a k which is imaginary. 
So from the, actually you see here rather from the boundary condition demanding that K is real, so you won't have exploding solution either at X plus infinity or X minus infinity, we get the fact that the energy is positive, but it's very intuitive because again, this is a free particle. And like in classical mechanics, what are the values of energy of a, a, a particle in classical mechanics? Which has P squared over 2M. Any energy which is positive. Everything is positive, possible in classical mechanics. Also here everything is possible. So here, in that sense, the energy is not quantized because we had an infinite system. We will see later when we put the particles in a box that the values of the energy can be quantized, unlike the classical part. So up to now, the, the fact that the spectrum uh, is continuous in K, it's okay, it's nice because okay, there are many changes compared to classical mechanics, but, but, but the fact that you can get any value of EK, maybe even you didn't think about that. Oh, that's obvious. It's, it's, here it's really obvious because it's a free particle, but it's not general. Because in a box it will not be like that, or in the hydrogen atom it's also not like that. You know that. So, in, class, in quantum mechanics we ask the question, what are the possible energy values that you can measure? Unlike in classical mechanics, in classical mechanics, what are the possible energy values you measure? Everything is possible. Anything is possible because anything positive, for example. But in quantum mechanics, it's not like this. You, you have specific energy, energy values that you can calculate from the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Okay, so what the, another way to look at this, what did we have before for the free packet? We had here EIKX, and here we had K squared. And that was the fact that we composed the wave function into the Fourier modes, EIKX. What is this function, phi e of x, that we are starting to learn? It's a, it's a basis. Instead of taking the, the wave function and writing it in some, let's say, some time t, writing that as a linear combination of waves, e, i, k, x, I'm doing something similar, but instead of the basis, which is Fourier basis, e, i, k, x, I have here a general basis, some function, phi e of x. And this is the basis I... Sp I uh, I look at this uh, thing as a combination of many functions. So in spirit, this is like Fourier transform, but, in, but instead of using EIKX, I'm using here a set of functions which is very particular to the problem. Why is the, this set function particular to the problem? Because they are the solutions of the Schrodinger equation with time independent, H phi equal E phi. For the case of free waves, the, Free particle, this is the Fourier mode. So I don't know if you had in the past uh, solved these type of equations and you know something about this problem, but this problem is called an eigenfunction problem. Eigenvalue slash function problem. And we say that phi e is the eigenfunction. The eigenfunction of what? Of the operator H. And the E, these are eigenvalues. Of course, there are a huge number of other applications of this eigenfunction expansion. This guy is called an eigenfunction expansion, like Fourier expansion. This type of solution enters in a, maybe you saw it previously in wave mechanics or whatever. This is very general, much more general than uh, just quantum mechanics. If you have some heat equation with some sources, and uh, it's a partial differential equation. You always expand it in these type of modes, not necessarily the modes are oscillatory, they can be decaying modes. This is super general. So if you did not encounter this, you really need to understand this because every problem that you're going to solve in the future, you're going to map onto this type of problem when you deal with heat waves in complicated material. This is a very basic tool in a mathematical analysis of uh, physical, of many physical problems. 
but you learn it here or maybe you saw it in the past, I don't know. Did you see this type of thing in the past? Yes or no? No, we can do it. Wave mechanics. Well, in wave mechanics, you saw it, with, uh, with not, but not with free waves, with some general functions. This is not a, you saw it for sure for EIKX, for sure, but, but this is not a Fourier component. You saw it now in mathematical physics, but this is now, in this semester. So again, I'm, in physics, did you see something like this where phi of E is not a wave, not EIKX? Yes or no? No. No, okay, so it's new for you. No, but this is an example. This is a free wave. So I said, if V of X, then you get the usual picture. But if V of X is not this simple thing, then of course not. Of course, I don't need, I don't need to use all this to solve the free particle. I already solved the free particle. The free particle is history. But I'm just showing you that this is similar. But the difference is that these functions are not E, I, K, X. They are given by by this, with this, the new thing is the potential. So, okay, so now we saw a system where the energy spectrum is continuous, every, as a function of k, all possible values of energy are possible. Great, now let us show a simple example where this doesn't happen. There are many, many cases. Most of the interesting cases are not continuous energy in some sense. So we want to solve the simplest problem, which is not v of x equal to 0. What is the simplest problem you can imagine? No, that's too complicated. <laughs> That will be a particle in a box, yes. A particle in an infinite box. Well, it's not exactly a box, but it would be a box if I did it in two or three dimensions, but in an infinite well. So I have a potential. This is my potential, V of x. This is, I call it point x0, and this I call point a. So a is the width of the potential, and the potential is infinity here, and it's infinity there. Here it's zero. So to go from inside to outside, you have to pay a price of infinite amount of energy, which means the particle is always inside. These two walls are perfect hard walls, which means that what will happen to a classical particle inside? You start with some energy V. You, what is the meaning of energy? You give it some initial velocity, and then it will go bang, 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 forever, right? And what are the possible energy levels of the classical particle? As I said before, anything is possible because the, actually the energy is p squared over 2m. So you start it with some energy, and then it can be anything, and you don't even think about this. All energy levels are possible in a classical world. Here I have a size a, and I already understand that to make this uh, meaningful, this a, I can guess already, this has to be small enough small enough to see the quantization of the energy levels that we will soon find inside here. If this is very wide and the mass of the particle inside is very, bi very big, then you will not see quantized energy levels, but this will, will, we, we will soon show. So mathematically, I write the potential like this. It is equal zero when x is between zero and a, and it is infinity otherwise. Physically, this means that psi x and t, I started in the box, psi x and t is equal zero outside the box.
And this also means that the same for phi of x. These wave functions, the a zero outside the box, you cannot be here. You can ask if you are really interested, what is this really modeling? So actually, maybe in a one-dimensional setting, this is impossible, but today you can make it many laboratories around the world, including in our university, so-called nanocrystals. Or they are also called quantum dots. These are just names. But these are materials. Actually, inside here in this thing, you have many atoms. For example, cadmium selenide, some semiconductor. And the size of this guy is roughly one nanometer. Now, around this guy, you build another material. This should be a circle, right? But I'm not a good role. Of some other material. Or oh, this material can stretch to infinity. So inside, you have cadmium selenide. And now, the for example, you, you throw inside one electron. This electron cannot escape. Of course, it's true that out here the energy is not infinite. But it's enough that it's very high. If it's very high, then the particle can only be here inside. It's also true that this is not a box. This is a particle in a sphere with hard walls. So this is a three-dimensional problem. But we will leave that small detail to later exercises. What I'm trying to say is that if you have an electron here inside and the size of this guy, this is super important, is, is roughly one nanometer, then you will see that this electron has energy levels which are quantized like a particle in a, in a spherical object with this type of model. So here you have V equals infinity. Then you can go to the laboratory and measure the energy levels, and you can show that the energy levels that you find out here are very nice agreement with experiment. If you want to do these things, this is done a lot. So it's very easy to, to find the energy levels of a particle in this guy. Of course, the difficult thing is to build such a device. That's a, different, that's a chemistry problem. OK, so let us solve this problem. in one dimension, and of course it's trivial. So what is phi of E? Okay, so I have to have h bar over 2m. This is the time independent Schrodinger equation, phi of E equal E phi of E. But here it's only in the interval. Now you say, oh my god, this is the same thing as a free particle. It's true, but it's only in the interval. So what is the difference with the free particle? The boundary conditions are different. We have to impose boundary conditions that the wave functions here and here are zero. So the solution here is phi of E is equal N sine K of X. You say, hey, that's not fair. Why sine k of x, and where is the cosine? Why do I say sine? Because, okay, you understand that when I plug it in here, what will I get? I take the derivative twice. Here I'll get k squared, and this will be a solution, right? But why did I wipe out already the cosine? You want the cosine, you can add it. So why did I wipe out the cosine? Because I know something from the boundary condition. I already used it, phi e x equals 0 equals zero. So if I add here plus cosine, the cosine on zero is not zero, so I, I delete it. So this is the solution. And what did I use now? I used only the boundary condition here. But there is another boundary condition, and that is the boundary condition on the other side. What will that give me? Okay, we will check. What does it give you? Okay, and here h squared the 2m k squared is equal e. It's a, exactly like a free wave, but there is a boundary condition. So, oops.
So the boundary condition on x equal to a tells me that sine ka is equal to zero. So the wave function here and here is zero. You cannot have a jump in the wave function. Why can't you have a jump in the wave function? We said the wave function out here is zero and here is not zero. What will happen if you have a jump in the wave function? Yeah, but we are in physics. So, of course, if it's not continuous, then what you said is that it's not continuous. That is, you can't have it in a Schrodinger equation. But you can argue here roughly that, okay, the potential here is infinite and here it's zero. So why can't I have a discontinuity? The reason is we generally do not have this from physical. Your, your, your consideration is also okay. But what, what, what happens when you have a, a derivative of a, what is a derivative in space of a function? What is, the, what is it related to? in physics of this particular wave function. What? The velocity. the velocity in the sense of that it's related to the momentum operator because the momentum operator is d over dx. So if you are not continuous, you have a huge contribution to the momentum which is, in, is not practical. So we always assume that the wave function is continuous function. It cannot jump on a spot. Of course, you can also look at it a different way. You can say in real physics, there's no such thing as a potential that is infinity here, infinity here. But in, in real physics, maybe you can build something close to this, something like this. And then the wave function will penetrate a little bit into the forbidden area, but very close it will be zero. So, and then when you make it more and more like this, then you expect, okay, it cannot jump suddenly, right? It cannot jump. In a real system, it cannot jump one point and then an epsilon after that, wow, the probability goes up. This we do not allow. Okay, so we are using this wave, uh, we are using this second boundary condition, which means that the wave functions here and here are going to zero, zero a phi, and this means that, what is the solution of this simple equation? Ka is equal n pi a equal n pi and what is n? n can be anything from 1 to up till infinity n is the quantum number of this problem here you see the discretization now of k k cannot get any value it can get discrete values in such a way that it solves the Schrodinger equation with the appropriate boundary conditions. So this is the quantization. Of course, n cannot be 0, because then k will be equal 0. And then what will happen to this wave function? It will be 0 everywhere. And that's not a wave function at all, because it's not normalizable, etc. So that's why n starts at 1. Um, OK, so these are the solutions. Now I can have the quantization of the energy. And it depends on an index, this index n that can get any value. And this is given by k squared h squared over 2m. So I have h bar squared over 2m. Here I have a squared n pi squared. So here you see that the energy levels are quantized because you get values 1, 2, 3. So you get different energy levels, but you cannot get all the energies. It's very non-classical in the sense that specific values of energies are attainable, but not all of them, because n is quantum. So this is quantum quantized energy levels. Again, this is only an example because this appears everywhere. Much more interesting problems.
Now I can write these energy levels like this, En, E tilde, N squared, where E tilde is the energy scale. In this example, it's H squared over 2M squared, MA squared, pi squared. What is important for us is this guy. This expression is again not surprising if you look at the units at least. This is what I called before P squared. You see, what was P squared? H bar over A. We had exactly the same thing for the Gaussian packet. The typical, what I call typical, roughly the second moment of momentum was H over A. That is, when you had a Gaussian, it had the width of size A. Also here, you have a width of size A, so you get H over A. That's units, that's typical momentum. So this is momentum squared and this is m. So this is more or less you expect. Of course, you need to walk a little bit to get this pi, but we didn't really walk really hard. But, so from units point of view and physics point of view, this is kind of expected. We saw this. And then we get this n squared. This means that if I plot, for example, the energy en over e tilde, in this box, so in this diagram I plot here the potential energy. So here I have infinity, this box is the potential energy. And then I have n equal one. I have energy levels inside. This is n equal one. So in these units of epsilon, epsilon, when n is equal one, this is simply one. And then the next guy is n equal two. So if this is going to be n equal 2, what is going to be the expression here? This is going to be 4. And then, if I continue like this, this is n equal 2, then n equal 3 will be up here, this will be 9. Because 3 to the power 2 is 9. So you see that the energy levels they are separated more and more as you go by. Let us look at this state. This state is called the ground state. What is the ground state? It's simply the, 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 the state which has the minimum of the energy. That is the lowest in energy that you can get. You cannot go be below this. Why do you have at all a ground state energy? What was the ground state energy of a classical particle in this problem? It was zero. Because I can put the particle anywhere here, down here, with zero energy, which means no momentum, and, and the energy will be zero in the classical limit. But in the quantum limit, this is not allowed. So the quantum energy in the minimum energy is higher than the classical minimum of energy. And again, this is the same thing, because the particle is here in this box. What is this energy here? What is the ground state energy? E1 is simply given by h squared pi squared over 2m a squared. And you see what happens. If A will go to zero, that is, I squeeze this, what will happen to this energy? It will go up high. Because, again, if I squeeze it very much, I have delta x in position very small, momentum very big, kinetic energy very big. So the smaller I am, this energy is higher than zero. The, this, the, the, this difference, which is the difference between the minimum of the classical guy and the minimum of the quantum guy becomes bigger and bigger as you become smaller and smaller in size of your object. <coughs> of course, also the difference between, let's say, the energy level this guy and this guy, this difference is small. When is it small? When, for example, the mass is big, because the, 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 the difference here is three, three times epsilon tilde. And when the mass is big, in some sense, you immediately see that this is small. And this also, or, or also when h bar goes to zero.
because if the h bar goes to zero, this difference is going to zero. So you see again the classical world peeping out in the sense that the classical world is when a is big or when m is big or when h is small. In, that, in those cases, the difference between the energy levels is not substantial. That's why I discussed a problem of a particle of this quantum dot. That's why I asked it to be one nanometer size and I wanted an electron inside. If I will put you inside the box like this room, this quantization is not relevant. But for a small particle, small mass, small size, this energy level can be measurable and attainable in, in, in the experiment. So it all makes perfect sense. And so now I can do one last step. I mean, I will always normalize this eigenstates. So phi n is an eigenstate. We're going to normalize it. So we said that phi n, this is the solution of time independent equation is n sine kx So what is normalization here? It means the following. I'll take phi n x and I integrate it where it's not zero. So this wave function is valid for x between zero and a. So I integrate it absolute value squared n squared dx and this is integral from zero to a sine kx squared dx n squared I, 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 thought, I assume already n is real so I don't need the absolute value and this guy is one so this is a normalization condition no, notice that this normalization condition is a little bit different than what we had before right because it's actually um, what we are going to always use, not, it's not mandatory. Why not? Because I add, in the solution of the Schrodinger equation, I add CE times phi E. So I can choose the constant, plug it into CE, or I can plug it into phi E. But I can choose these phi in such a way that they are normalized, and that will uh, impose some condition on the, on the coefficients that come from the initial conditions. So this is a, 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 our... Uh, just uh, we're going to ask for this. This not comes from some deep conservation of probability. Unless you can think about it in a different way, let us think about the particle that is in this state. Then you want to say that we are going to give you the wave function and it's already normalized. So the C, if, if you are in this state, the CE is going to be one. That's the same thing as saying that. So if, if I start in, a, in the ground state and I normalize the wave function, I know that the constant that enters in this time-dependent solution of Schrodinger equation is going to be trivial, it's going to be one. So we will always use with this type of conditions that this guy is one. Now this integral is trivial, um, and then I can solve this and get this n, and then I can find finally the wave function, which is normalized at some state n, e half, which is the usual units. n pi x over a. So this is the solution and we have infinite number of solutions here because n can be anything between one and infinity. So just to emphasize the general plan, okay, let us look a little bit now on the, we, we looked at the energy levels, now let us look at the eigenfunctions.
So the eigenfunctions. So let us start with the ground state, n equal 1. And I'll plot phi n. Do I want to plot? I'll, I'll plot phi n itself. It looks something like this. You see here sine 1 times pi x over a when x is 0 and 1. I get this guy. I chose here. It could be also minus. This is not the issue here. I chose all of them to be positive. And then you get this one mode. And you see that you are spreading out in order, if you are localized, you get a lot of energy, so you spread out. But you have to satisfy the boundary condition, and that's why, of course, eventually you go down here and here. So this is a compensation on the, you want to be wider to reduce kinetic energy, but you cannot be here and here, so this is as wide as possible. What, what will happen when you have n equal 2? This guy is called the first excited state. So you have a ground state, and one step above it is the first excited state. This one. How does this, this guy look like? It looks like this. You have one oscillation. Why, you look at this wave function. Why is this wave function energy is bigger than this one? How can you see from this picture that this guy has a higher energy? See, this is four, this is one. Why, why, why is it obvious? Well, that's the obvious difference, but why, why is this oscillation implying higher energy? How do you, how do you more or less uh, see this? The, the reason is that, what is the energy actually? The, re, the energy is p squared over 2m average over this guy. So if I wanted to calculate the energy, I could do the average energy, but it's the same thing. It's 2m average because there's no potential energy inside this box so when you have something that is very wiggly for example something like this if you compare this guy with your eyes to this guy you should more or less understand why this guy has more kinetic energy. And the reason is that if you take the second derivative he, here, you know, here it's more or less zero because it's more or less flat, but the more wiggly you are, the more second derivative, so to speak, you have, and when you multiply it, then you'll have more and more energy. So the wiggliness, the number of oscillations, as you increase it, makes more and more kinetic energy because the kinetic energy is the second derivative of psi, which gives you the k squared. Yeah, because what is this guy? This is simply sine kx. So when I take the derivative, I get, of course, k squared out, and k is proportional to n, so the, the bigger is k, the more kinetic energy, and the bigger is k, the more oscillations you have. That's the, wave, the meaning of the wave number. When the, when, when the wavelength is smaller, you have more oscillations. In fact, the, you see here that here you have no zero crossing. Here I have one zero crossing, and the general rule is for the nth energy level, you have if you don't count these zeros, you have n minus 1 crossings. So the number of crossings of 0, like here you have 1, if you add to that 1, you get the quantum number. And you can see so that for the 3, etc. So the number of tens increases the, the energy level because it makes the wavelength, this is this wavelength here, smaller and smaller. 
and small wavelength is high energy. Here you can see another thing. In some sense, I want to claim that this guy is more or less classical. In what sense is it classical? Can you see? It's strange, but it is in some sense. So this is for high end. High energy levels are many times considered to be more classical. If I will look at phi n squared, I will get very fast oscillations. Something like this. Now, if I cross grain a little bit, that is, assume that I cannot measure with 100% accuracy. I have some width of my measurement device. What is the probability of finding the particle somewhere along this thing? It's, it's uniform. All points are more or less equal. If you cannot distinguish, imagine that these oscillations, the distance between these oscillations is 10 to the minus 300. It's meaningless, right? So it's more or less uniform. Now, why do I claim this is like a classical particle? In what sense is this like a classical particle? If you have a particle in a box, a classical one, and it just moves, how does it move inside here? It moves with a constant speed and bounces back. Bang, bang. Let us say you measure it at some time. You measure it somewhere. And then you measure another time. You measure at random times you will have a uniform distribution of these particles in space. For example, you ever, is this clear why? Because a classical particle just goes back and forward and it goes in constant speed. And then I measure it at random times or maybe after I did one, 2,000 oscillations plus something, just randomly. So I'll find the particles uniformly distributed in space. This is very particular to the particle in infinite box. So let's say you have an harmonic potential. What is the shape of the wave function without solving the Schrodinger equation for very large quantum numbers n? How do you think it will look like from this insight? Of course, I know the answer, so it's easy for me to ask. Exactly the opposite. So it's good that he said it in Hebrew. Where will the, the classical particle, how does it work? It, it comes here, and then it stays long time here, and then it goes back, stays long time here, and goes back. Why does it stay long time here and here? Because it slows down. It takes its kinetic energy, moves it to the potential energy, right? So the wave functions at very large end here will have a lot of oscillations. And they will look something like this. And then they'll decay. Because, again, the classical particle stays a long time here, so you sample it more, and you have a lot of oscillations. So this will be the phi n of the, of the harmonic oscillator. And what will happen for the ground state? Well, this is the picture for the particle in the well. What will happen to the ground state in the harmonic oscillator? It will be something similar, but it will penetrate here and here. You see, this is very similar to this. How will it penetrate? Will it be exponential? Will it be Gaussian? This you cannot say, right? But you start to feel what are the solutions of the Schrodinger equation with time independent and with some general potential. You have to know, I give you a potential, you have to say, okay, there's a difference between low energies and high energies. And you need to, with your head, with your physical imagination, more or less understand how will the wave function look inside this potential in a very qualitative way, not precisely. To, to, to find it precisely, of course, you need to solve the equations. But 
this is a problem that you did not encounter up till today because you didn't have phi, so, but you need to be able to think about some potential and more or less guess how will the wave function in the ground state behave and in the high energy limit, more or less, how will it look like. Of course, this, uh, don't worry if you cannot see this immediately. It will take some time and some practice, but this is the goal. A good physicist, give him some potential, he more or less knows how to draw the wave functions uh, qualitatively, where are the peaks, where are the oscillation, this depends on energy, etc. That is your goal to understand this and hopefully by the end of the course you will build such an intuition. Okay, so let us summarize this. Yeah. What is the meaning of uh, that the wave, wave function goes uh, uh, below the, the box? Below the, what do you mean below the box? When you draw the second uh, model? So that's uh, in the harmonic, in, in this, uh, the second model is harmonic potential or? When you draw the, the second mode? The second mode. I just uh, noticed that this is, okay, th my mistake. Here I'm drawing on one figure two things. I'm drawing both the potential and phi. The potential is this thing. Phi is a separate thing. They're both functions of x, but they don't have even the same unit. So, and phi can be negative or, it doesn't mean that, okay, I don't know if that was the question, but. If I look at the second mode, uh, n equal uh, 2, but now I look at the square of the amplitude, because that is the probability density, it will look something like this. This guy is always positive as it should, but the phi itself is an amplitude that can be negative. Now, I plotted it, by the way, like this. But it would be okay if I plotted it also like that. This is just the choice of the phase of the wave function. They're both the same thing. That will determine the sign of the CE when I expand it, but this is not important. Okay, so remember, this guy is always greater or equal to zero, but th these phi ends can be negative. You saw, I mean, even for a free wave, it was a complex number. EIKX is complex, so it can be in the complex plane if you want. So this lesson, we understand what is the, the mission, so to say, of quantum mechanics. Let us say I want to find psi x on t. So this is, we are now summarizing. How do you do this? So let's say it's a program on your computer. Give the initial condition. Of course, I need to know some potential. You give me the potential. Is it harmonic oscillator? Is it something else? Whatever it can be, many things. But first tell me what is the field. Exactly like a Newton's equation. You cannot solve Newton's equation if you don't say what is the force. Also here, if you don't say what is the potential, you cannot do anything. So th this is physics. You need to specify your problem and give me this potential. And then you start with give me some initial condition. The first thing you do, you don't solve the Schrodinger equation which depends on time, you, you solve the time independent Schrodinger equation. This is the step. This is the difficult step. Because what are these energies and what are these phi e's? That can be hard for, for complicated enough potentials. But if you managed, if you're lucky, then you have psi x of t as a sum of c e phi 
phi e of x e minus e t over h bar. And we said this is a sum of energy. And now we can be a little bit more specific. What is the meaning of sum of energy? So sum of energy, we had two examples up till now. It was an integral over decay for free particle. Right? You summed over all the k's, and the k could be from minus infinity to infinity. And what will it be for a particle in the box? Exactly. So that is the meaning of this sum. Sum of sum of rho n, and in this case, the quantum numbers go from n to one to infinity. Now, we have one quantum number, n. But why was that? Why do we have only one quantum number? How will we have two or three? Exactly. We worked in one dimension, and that's why I had one quantum number n. But immediately you can imagine if my b I don't live with a one-dimensional box, but with a two-dimensional box, I'll have two dimen two quantum numbers, one for x and one for y. And if I and the number of quantum numbers is exactly the same as the dimension. This is something general. So more generally, I'll have more than sum of n, x, n, y, n, z. And there are many different quantum numbers, depending also on your coordinate system, etc. <coughs> why did we have an integral and why did we have summation? This is because in this problem, we had a continuum of energy levels, of energy, k greater than zero, and the dispersion was ek, is going like k squared. So the quantum number, so to say, k is analog to n, but k can be anything of energy. The energy is greater than zero, and k is between minus infinity to infinity. Here we add discrete energy level. Right? There are other systems which are both, both discrete energy levels and continuous energy level. For example, the hydrogen atom. They are both discrete energy levels, and then from some energy, they are continuum. So you can have something instead of an integral, a sum, it can be partly a sum, partly an integral. My point is that you need to know precisely, it's very important to know what is your spectrum, what is your energy, how is your energy behaving in order to even know what is the meaning of these summations. Okay? And there are different systems which have very different behaviors depending on not if the energy in them is continuous or not. Why did we get here in a continuum? It's very simple. It's because the system is infinite and then there is no box confining and if there's no box and there's no size scale, then the, you can say every energy is possible. But once you have a box, you have a length scale and if you have a length scale, you have a K scale and if you have a K scale, you have an energy scale and then you have discretization of your energy. So the fact that we are confined and small made this possible to get this quantum behavior. <coughs> we only need to now to understand how do I get this CE. So to start proving this, we first want to prove uh, 
the steady state solution. What does it mean, steady state? Steady state means time independent. That is steady, it's not evolving with time. And that is, the steady state solutions are essentially a different way to say the time independent solutions of the Schrodinger equations. These are the eigenfunctions and other equations. Steady state, no time. You know, when you are dead, there's no time. You don't move, you don't do anything. Steady state is steady, it's fixed. <coughs> and we were going to claim that phi n x forms and also normal basis, which is complete for the mathematicians. What does it mean, also normal basis? Well, normal means that these phi n's, they are normalizable. You can, you can uh, uh, essentially what I'm trying to say is that in one dimension, you will have this identity, which is identity of choice. This integral exists, and we will always work with normalized basis. So for every n, n equal one till infinity, we always call this, we always have this normalization constant, and this is normalization simply. What does it mean also, orthogonality? It means that the wave functions, phi n, phi n, the complex conjugate of phi n, of x, phi m, of x, dx, from minus infinity to infinity. This is equal to delta m n, where this uh, symbol is called the delta of Kronecker. Delta of Kronecker means the following, delta m n, this is one, or zero, it's one if m is equal to n, and it's, otherwise, it's zero. It's actually very much related to the delta function, but in discrete type of step. Why do we, why do we need discrete? Because the energy levels are discrete. Think about the particle in the box. Now, of course, you can do this quite easily by checking. You just take the wave functions of the particle in the box. Let us do it, for example, for the ground state and the excited state. What is, for the particle in the box, you can see this with your eye, right? For example, let us take n equal 1, phi 1 looks like this, phi 2 looks like this. So the integral, in our case from 0 to a, phi 1 star, phi 0, a phi 2, dx is the integral from 0 to a of this times this, dx. And this is obviously 0. Why is it 0? Because you have something symmetric here around the 0, this one. So when I multiply it by this function, so here I multiply positive by positive, and here positive by negative, and it's symmetric around the, or, or, around the middle. So the multiplication will give you something which is like something like that. And then the area underneath this guy will be half here and half here will be different signs and then it's zero. So you, you can see with your eyes that these two guys are also normal. And if you plug in sine kx and put in n m m, you can easily show that these integrals, all of them are zero. So this by inspection, you can easily show that this holds, this is the orthogonality 
this holds uh, for, um, for these uh, bases. And you know Fourier analysis. So in Fourier analysis, you have something very similar. If you take a sine and a cosine, or a, the, 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 the base is also, also normal if you take two different values. That's why you can expand the function around here. I will, uh, at this stage, what is the time? OK, so at this stage, I will not prove it, but we will assume it. Next lesson, we will prove it. But let us see, you, you will have to believe me for now that this is true for any Hamiltonian. No, doesn't matter what is V of x. This is correct. Let us assume this. Bear with me because you want to go home. Let us assume this is correct, and then we, we can s solve this problem completely and find the wave functions. So why is this so important? So we have, generally speaking, we have h psi i h psi dot. Then we said psi. Let's sum it now over n, discrete energy levels with n. We're going to call it Cn. I'm only going to read discrete systems, phi n of x, e to the minus i, et over h bar. This is the general solution, and our aim is to find this Cn, that I called previously Ce, but now it's discrete energy level, so I use this interpretation of the sum. What do I know here? I can look at psi x at time t0. This is the initial condition. What is this guy? This is sum over cn phi n of x. Sum over all the n's. For example, in the box, it's n equal 1 to infinity. Now, you believe me because you are patient, and thank you for believing that I have this orthogonality relation. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply this from the left with some phi m, some other, some, some, one of these functions. You see here I have infinite number of functions corresponding to infinite number of, a, a wave of energy levels. So I'm going to multiply this equation by phi m star psi x zero dx and integrate. This is equal to sum over all the n, cn, integral from minus infinity to infinity, phi m star, psi cn, not cn, phi n, dx. So again, I just took the equation, I multiplied here and integrated. Multiplied both sides and integrated both sides. But here, you see here, what is this guy if that general, uh, just th that general thing is correct? Then this is delta mn. And if this is delta mn, when I sum over n, what do I get here? Yeah. Cm. So to summarize, Cm is the, you take the eigenfunction of the time independent Schrodinger equation. That means you solve the h phi equal e phi. You know, you know this function by solving the time independent Schrodinger equation. Then you take the, the m for, you need to do it for all m. You take the initial condition and you integrate and you are done. Why am I done? Because once I know these guys, here I have m, but you can call it n. I can find the time-dependent solution equation. And this is uh, similar to what we did for a free particle, right? For a free particle, what did we have here? EIKX. E that was the Fourier transform that you knew about. But instead of EIKX, now I have more generally some function 
which is specific for our potential v of x, which we need to find exactly what is this function. We have one example that we solve it, but there are many other examples. So by doing so, we have in, in principle, I'm not saying in practice, in principle, we solve the Schrodinger equation. Mathematicians can go now home and, okay, we solved everything. Why? Because uh, uh, we, we have a way, a recipe at least, to get CM. Of course, this is too general in the sense that it doesn't show you what is the physics. For example, what is the interpretation of the CM? What is the meaning of CM? Can it, what, what, what do you think it means physically from point of view of measurement? Oh. And measurement of what? It's the amplitude of what? Of it's you're right. Of what? Of momentum, position. In this case, position. yes. No. Energy. So this number, this we will show, and you read in textbooks. Cm absolute value squared will give you the amplitude of measuring an energy level with quantum number m. And it's again similar to what we have with momentum. We had G of K was the amplitude of measure momentum. And now we get the CM, we need to interpret the physical meaning of it. So it's not enough to do the math. We need to actually understand what we are doing. And that means you need to read more. So we will stop here because it's late, but we will continue from this point. So please go and read the, the solution time, in the, time dependent Schrodinger equation, time independent Schrodinger equation. It exists in all the textbooks. Try to understand the meaning of the summation, discrete energy levels, continuous energy levels. Play with this a little bit and come back next uh, lesson and we will continue from here. Okay, so thank you and goodbye.